I would like to talk to you a little bit about look and measurements, how to perform them accurately, and some tips and tricks. Well, it has, has been quite a while since uh, we haven't done a presentation on our own on the Omicron Lab Symposium. So we thought it's time to do a presentation again and update you with the latest uh, findings that we gained in the last years and share the knowledge that we learned with you. So today it's about loop gain measurements. The first part uh, of today of this presentation will be a little bit the review on the voltage injection method about stability margins and then we're going to go into details how do you select the right injection point, uh, how to fight noise on the measurements, how is that related to the injection signal level, then what can an output filter, an additional output filter or an input filter do to the loop gain measurement or to the loop gain curve and as a last part I'm going to show you a little bit what you can do with the expression traces in the body analyzer suite how you can manip manipulate measurement data. As a short review, let's start with the, uh, with the loop gain itself or the closed loop system. Um, I always use this very basic back converter as an example. We have the input voltage on the left hand side. Oh, where is my mouse? I change that to a pointer. Yeah, so we have the input voltage on the left hand side, then we have the switching converter and then we have the feedback where the output voltage is measured and then compared with the reference voltage Then the error signal is fed into the compensator and with that we use negative feedback to keep the output voltage stable and that's very often the goal of such a power supply where we want to have a perfectly stabilized uh, voltage source to drive the load. Now we can calculate how the output voltage behaves. We start here at the error voltage. The error voltage is then calculated by the reference minus the output voltage and multiplied by the compensator gain then fed into the PWM circuit to create a new duty cycle that is then fed into the uh, power stage to get a new output voltage. And that's what we call the loop gain. So it's the product of all the transfer functions in the loop. It includes the compensator, it includes the PWM transfer function, and it includes the transfer function of the power stage. That's this GVD, that's the duty cycle to output transfer function. Yeah, and that's the loop gain. And uh, let's note it TFS. And if you look at the equations, we can calculate how is the line rejection, how is the output impedance, and we find that uh, low output impedance and high rip rejection and uh, good regulation is achieved if you have high loop gain. So we need the high loop gain. And if the loop gain is smaller than one, then that one is zero dB, so as soon as we cross the zero dB line, after the crossover frequency, loop gain is smaller than one, the feedback has nearly no effect anymore. So then only for the frequencies where we have a loop gain that is higher than one or higher than zero dB, uh, feedback has really an effect on the output. The high loop gain is not possible for all frequencies anyhow and also not desired, considering uh, that we often have a switching system where we have a switching frequency and the duty cycle every new um, switching cycle. It doesn't make sense to go very high in frequency uh, that there are limits, for example, the Nyquist or Shannon criterion, that you should not go above half the switching frequency to avoid uh, liasing issues. So we don't want to have a loop gain that is very, very high for all frequencies. So we will eventually cross the zero dB line and have a loop gain that is smaller than one. So very often a loop gain curve has a shape like this, where we have a high low frequency gain that we want to have to achieve good regulation. Um, in theory, this would be an integrator, so it would continue like that, but oft often there is gain limitation that can be of digital nature if you have resolution limits, or it can be 
the maximum amplification of an operational amplifier so that this curve starts to flatten out at low frequencies. Then we have the loop gain that should cross with slope of minus one, which means minus 20 dB per decade. And with that, we will achieve roughly a phase margin of 90 degrees. And at very high frequency, there is an additional pole placed uh, to increase the robustness of the system and just reduce the frequencies that we don't need anyhow. So we don't want them to propagate in the loop. Now, today we want to talk about how we can measure the loop gain. And the method that we use is called the voltage injection method. It was presented by Middlebrook in the 70s. There is a nice paper about it. It's called measuring uh, loop gain in feedback systems. Uh, you can find the reference at the end of this presentation, and that's a short summary of that. Uh, so the method works that we break the loop um, by inserting a small resistor. So we don't break it physically. The system stays in closed loop operation, uh, but we insert an additional small injection resistor that you can see here. And then we impress an additional injection voltage across the resistor using an isolation transformer, for example, so that this voltage is a differential voltage, not reference to ground, and just driving a current through the injection resistor that causes a voltage drop, and this extra voltage drop is inserted into the loop. So let's assume that point B changes a little bit because we inject this voltage here. Then the system will measure the change at B, and it will react and cause a reaction at point A. And if the body 100 is connected, the channel 1 goes to point B and channel 2 to point A. It measures the transfer function from B to A over the loop, and that's the loop gain that the body 100 measures. And we're going to note it here as TV. Why V? Because it's a voltage. So the body 100 injects a voltage, and it measures two voltages because it's two voltage measurement channels, for example, in that case. So we pick up the point, the voltage at point B and the voltage at point A, and get the loop gain. Now, to get the loop gain, we need to assume that the signal that flows through the feedback circuit is only forward, and that the information flows only in terms of voltages, because the volume 100 will only pick up the voltages. It will not measure the currents unless you connect a current probe to it, but then it will ignore the voltages. So the easiest way is to make sure that the information flow is in form of voltages and that it's forward. However, at every connection point, there is not only voltage, but there is also some current flow because the signal source will have a finite output impedance and the input that measures the signal will have a finite input impedance, so there will also be some current flow present. And the injection point can be modeled using uh, equivalent impedances as a voltage source that drives the signal, then the additional injected signal, and the signal that comes out is then measured by someone that has a finite input impedance, and that causes the next reaction or that causes the signal to flow around the loop. So if we calculate all these details, then what the body 100 really measures is the loop gain and some additional uh, ratios of impedances. So the measured loop gain, that's the TV, equals the real loop gain multiplied by 1 plus Z out over Z in plus Z out over Z in. So that's an additional, uh, yeah, that's basically what we measure. And these terms are either very small or nearly one if the ratio between the output impedance and the input impedance is large. So the input impedance must be very large and the output impedance must be a lot smaller than the ratio of that term is approximately one, so we can ignore it. And for the second term, it's all, it is the ratio set out over set in, and that is a very small value. And if the measured loop gain is a lot larger than this ratio, then we can ignore it as well. And that's an important point when selecting an injection point to measure voltage 
loop gain. So we need to find a point that fulfills the condition that the input impedance in signal direction is a lot larger than the output impedance where the signal comes from. And that's seen from the injection point. So looking from the injection point in signal direction, the impedance should be large or larger than the impedance looking backwards from where the signal comes from. Very often this is the case at the output of a voltage source. If you have a buck converter, for example, that has large output capacitance and then you have a feedback divider, then the output impedance at the capacitor is very small and the feedback divider has hundreds of kilo ohms, for example, and that's a lot larger. And that would be a nicely suited, uh, suitable point at the top of the feedback divider or before the feedback divider. If you have an input of an operational amplifier, it normally has a very high impedance, could be hundreds of kilo ohms, even probably a mega ohm, and that's also very suitable. On the other hand, at the output of an operational amplifier, the impedance is normally pretty low milli ohms or so. And the best way would be between two operational amplifiers, where the ratio, of course, is very large. A second important thing that we should not forget is that there should not be any parallel signal pass that bypasses the injection resistor. Otherwise, we are not measuring the complete loop, but only a fraction of the loop. So the injection resistor must be at the point where there is no parallel pass bypassing, where the signal can bypass the injection point. Yeah, when we measure phase margin and gain margin, then again, don't forget that uh, this is a sampled system. It's, if it's a switching regulator, we don't need to measure the control loop above half the switching frequency. And if you measure to the switching frequency or a little bit higher, then normally you can see the switching frequency in the measurement. In this curve, for example, the switching frequency was at 300 kilohertz. So here is 100 kilohertz, 200, 300. And this peak here is from the switching frequency. Yeah, to find, for example, the phase margin, we check where is the zero dB crossover frequency of the gain curve, that's the red curve here. So we find the frequency here, and then we measure how much phase is still left before we hit the positive feedback point. And in that measurement, that's directly the phase red uh, towards the zero degree line. So in that case, it would be around 30 degrees of phase margin. Then uh, to read the gain margin, we do the same on the phase. So we check where is the zero degree crossover frequency of the phase, and then how much gain margin is left until the, we hit the positive feedback point, and that's 41 dB in that case. Yeah, don't forget that the phase margin can be read directly from the measurement if you use this injection method. So the phase margin is the distance to zero degrees and not to minus 180 degrees. The reason is that the system is running closed loop and the injected signal will run through the inverting error amplifier and get an additional 180 degree phase shift. So if we imagine that we have the injection point here and the signal injected that travels through the entire system and comes back with zero degree phase delay and then we amplify it it will do the same it will get bigger 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 so that's the positive feedback point and you can imagine that zero degree is the the bad thing in that case compared to a theoretical open loop gain that you calculate by taking out the summing node and then calculating g times h for example this misses a minus compared to the measurement that we are doing here where the summing node or the error amplifier that is present in the system and the signal travels additionally through the minus. So the positive feedback point in that measurement is at zero degrees and not at minus 180 degrees. The same can be looked at in an Nyquist chart. That's the same transfer function as before, but uh, in the imaginary planes, so a real axis on the bottom and imaginary axis on the y-axis and that's the transfer function is the red curve here and we can see in that case the positive feedback point marked here at plus one uh, plus one because one is zero db uh, 
um, gain and at the, the x-axis that's zero degrees of phase. So here we have the positive feedback point. And the same measurement as before, we can see the 32 degrees of phase margin. So if we would tilt that transfer function by an extra 32 degrees, it would hit the positive feedback point. And if we increase the gain so that the entire transfer function would become larger, then it could hit the positive feedback point eventually uh, if we increase the gain by 40 dBs in that case. And an extra value that you can see in the Nyquist chart is the shortest, shortest distance to the instability point of the transfer function. So in that case, that's a distance of 0 0.53, and that's the vector stability margin. What does it tell us? Well, normally phase or gain change is not coming alone, so you can also have a combination of a changing phase and an increasing or reducing gain, and if you have a very low vector stability margin, then uh, this could indicate that even a small change in phase and gain could cause a system instability. Yeah, that's it. So some tips on how to select the injection point. In low voltage systems, this is mostly between the output voltage and the feedback divider, as mentioned before. That's very easy to do if the voltage is not too high. Then that's a very good uh, measurement point. If the voltages are higher, this is inconvenient, of course, because you need to inject at a very high voltage, then uh, you need to have enough signal um, to make the system measure the signal. Also, you need to use probes, and that makes it more difficult to measure the small signal changes, and the measurement gets more noisy, so it's more tricky on high voltage systems. If the system is running on very high power, so it's a kilowatt system, for example, then normally there is a beautiful signal conditioning chain. So you have the feedback divider that measures, for example, the output voltage, and then there is operational amplifiers and filters, and it's very easy to find a suitable injection point in this signal conditioning chain that is often, for example, 0 to 5 volts. Um, so on high power systems, very often you find a convenient point in the signal conditioning chain where you can break the loop easily and measure at low voltages without needing to go for 800 volts, for example. If it's a, for example, auxiliary power supply with very low power um, and very low component count, um, it gets more tricky, more difficult. Often there is no signal conditioning chain and uh, finding a suitable injection point uh, is tricky then you will need to inject at the higher voltage and you will need to use probes. The probes will divide the DC and the AC portion of the signal, which will then cause the measurement to be more noisy. Um, so it's more tricky than in higher power applications, generally from my experience. If you have very low voltage systems, like 1 volts, 1.2 volts, or 0 0.8 volts, then you need to be aware that there could be remote sensing in place. Uh, and that there uh, could be a specific sense ground. And in that case, you need to be very careful that the body 100 uses the same ground that the controller uses to get the same signals. Sometimes it might even make sense to use differential probes to avoid uh, ground difference, difference and grounding issues. If you have digital control, then uh, I found it to be tricky to inject directly at the ADC pin, so I would not recommend do that, but always try to be before the last passive filter, or if you have a signal conditioning chain, then do it in the chain and not at the ADC pin. The ADC pin is very sensitive to noise, and if you connect the entire body 100 um, with all the injection transformer and the probes, you will add quite some uh, additional capacitance to ground, and you could easily get some common mode noise injected into this very sensitive point, so I would avoid doing that. Let's have a look at some examples of injection points. Um, if we have a very simple analog loop in a back, then we can see the output voltage here and the feedback divider with the type 3 compensator in that case, and uh, the injection resistor can easily be placed on top of the feedback divider. Just make sure that the um, connection of this uh, 
extra zero or what it is, does not bypass the injection resistor. Otherwise, you would lose that information. So there must be a single pass of information flow or of signal flow where you put the injection resistor. Then channel one of the body 100 is placed on the feedback side of the injection resistor and the probe measures with respect to ground because the error amplifier also measures with respect to ground. So we use the same ground, try to use the same ground here. Channel two then measures the system reaction and uh, is on the other side of the injection resistor. Another demo circuit, it's also a back circuit. Uh, we have the inductance here, the output capacitance here. It has some overcurrent protection or is a current mode in that case. And after that, we have the sense line here that goes to the feedback node with a compensation network here. And R10 here, one mega ohm, R11, that's the feedback divider. And the injection is could be done here also with respect to ground because the circuit measures the voltage with respect to ground. Another example of a demo circuit, uh, it's a flyback, an isolated one. So we have the input voltage here, we have the output voltage here, and then the feedback sends line here via an optocoupler to the primary side. And here R15 is already placed, and that's the right point for injection in that case. Um, it's easy to measure, and C12 is already considered to parallel R14, but not parallel R15. So we can easily change the R15 to 10 ohms or 5 ohms and inject here, and then again measure with respect to ground, because the information flow in here is also with respect to ground. So the signal information flow. Yeah, if there is a current source, then it's similar, but slightly different. Um, if, the, for example, in that case, it's an LED driver, the current through the LEDs is controlled and measured uh, here on the current channel resistor, and the error amplifier again gets a voltage signal. So basically, it's still a voltage loop that uh, at that point, the signal flow is in form of voltage, and we can inject a voltage. Also, that point is satisfying the uh, impedance condition because the information that comes from the current is pretty low impedance. There is just uh, the shunt impedance is very low. All this point is very low impedance. And then we have the error amplifier, which is an operational amplifier input. So that's high impedance. And we can therefore easily place a resistor in the sense line. In that case, it's on the I sense positive line. And two differential probes are used to measure with respect to the iSense negative line, because the uh, error amplifier is also measuring the differential voltage at that point in the circuit. The same here, same uh, situation, just on a circuit. We have here the 0.1 ohm shunt resistor. We have the iSense positive and the iSense negative line, and we can put an extra injection resistor in the iSense positive line and measure with respect to the Eisen's negative line using, for example, two differential probes. Yeah, a question that comes very often, is calibration necessary? Do we need to perform a through calibration? And I would say normally not. The basic accuracy of the setup should be sufficient if you have compensated the probes correctly. And to test that, you just connect the two probes of the body 100 to the output of the body 100. And so both probes receive, are connected to the red pin here. So they receive the signal of the output of the body 100. And both probes are connected to ground on the black pin here. So that's the shield of the output. And then we should get a flat line at zero dB and zero degrees over the frequency range of interest. And you can also adjust the probes uh, using the compensation screws. And if you adjust them equally, then you will get zero dB and zero degree line, and you don't need to perform software calibration. And I like to check the calibration and make calibration in a setup like this, not directly on the device on the test, 
because it will, there will be a lot more noise present if you measure on the device on the test itself. And what is corrected is basically just the difference of the two probes. So it's the difference between the channel 1 and channel 2 connection to where the probes are connected. So if the probes are not equal, then this can be corrected. Another question that appears quite often is, why is there so much noise at low frequency? And I even heard people say that the Body 100 has a bad performance at low frequency because there is so much noise. Well, there are several answers to this. One of them is, first of all, don't pay too much attention to the low frequency because the information that is normally important or often important is the crossover frequency interface margin. And that's at a higher frequency normally. Anyhow, I would like to explain a little bit where this noise at low frequency is coming from and how it can be avoided. First of all, we need to look at the injection point a little bit more in detail. The voltage that is injected from the body 100, here it's VI, is the injection voltage, is normally, let's assume now, is constant um, because we inject, for example, 100 millivolts. By driving a current from the body 100 source through the injection resistor over the injection transformer, which in this case with the BB100 is a one-to-one -one transformer with roughly zero dB insertion loss, 0.1, something like that. So it can be ignored in simple calculations. Now, what we see here is a mesh, and the sum of the voltages is zero, and if the frequency is low and the gain very high, then you will see nearly no signal change at the feedback node because the system has high gain, so it will compensate, and it will cause the output voltage to swing so that the injected voltage is rejected. That's basically the goal of the feedback loop. It's what it wants to do. It wants to reject any signal or any change of the feedback node because it wants to keep it stable. So the output voltage will equal roughly the injected voltage. And only a very, very little portion will be present at the feedback node. Let's assume we have a gain of 60 dB. That's a factor of 1000. And let's assume we inject 30 millivolts. Then the signal that is present at the feedback node will be a thousandth of that, so that's 30 microvolts. And you can maybe imagine that resolving a phase difference between a 30 microvolt signal and a 30 millivolt signal in the presence of switching noise is tricky. However, you can easily solve that problem if you inject more signal, because the gain is constant. It will be 60 dBs, no matter if you inject a small voltage or a large voltage. But what will change is what is left at the feedback node because of the finite gain. So if we inject 300 millivolts, we will have 3 millivolts to measure, and that's a lot easier. 3 millivolts can be resolved easily. So we need a little bit more injection signal. And on this graph, you can see that you can, how the relation between dBm and injected voltage with different injection resistors. So this line is for a 1-ohm resistor, 4.7-ohm resistor, 10-ohm, 47- and 100-ohm resistor. So if you need higher injection signals, use a larger resistor. If you need lower ones, use a smaller resistor so you can scale the range where it can work. Here the output level is marked in dBm from minus 30 to plus 25. If you use the amplifier for the body 100, you can go up to 25 dBm. If you don't like dBm, just change it in the options. There is a possibility to change the unit to volts, if you prefer. But I like to work with dBm. Uh, well, zero dBm is one milliwatt at 50 ohms. And yeah, it's just easy to change by minus 10 dB in steps or things like that. It's a, I would say, you have to get used to it, or you like it or not, or you get used to it. Yeah. If you increase the signal size, don't forget that we use linear tools um, to design the compensator, for example. Um, this is small signal stability, what we're talking about, and the systems that we measure should be linear and time invariant. And linear means that the result must be independent of the signal size. And to check that, you can easily measure at one signal level and then, for example, reduce the level or increase the level by a factor of 10 dB. 
And if the result changes, then your signal is too large. So you need to further reduce it until you have some margin that you can increase without corrupting or changing the result to be sure that you stay in a linear region. This could, for example, look like the graph shown here on the left. The signal is for sure too high. And if we re reduce the signal level, then we can see that the curves get smoother and these discontinuities and from the left side disappear. Of course, if we reduce signal level, then we come into the troubles uh, again that we mentioned before that at low frequency there will be more noise. And for that, there is this shaped level function where you can, or variable level function, where you can change the injection level depending on the frequency. At low frequency, the system is normally very insensitive to large signals. Everything is happening slowly and the system can react. If the frequencies get higher, then you might run into slew rate limitations and you need to reduce the signal level to not drive it into nonlinearities. So with the shaped level, you can adjust the output level of frequency to get a clean plot at low frequency and not overdrive the system at high frequencies. Another thing that comes up frequently is the phase wrapping. So if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that the phase is very, very noisy. It jumps from minus 100 degree to plus 180 degrees and there is a lot of noise on the phase or it seems that there is a lot of noise on the phase. In reality, there is very little noise on the phase. You can see the plot below is exactly the same plot, just unwrapped. And what does wrapping mean? It means that the Bode 100 or any measurement instrument cannot distinguish between a plus 180 and minus 180 degree phase shift. You will never know if, it, if the two sine waves have been shifted by minus 180 or plus 180 degrees, they just look inverted. So you cannot tell if it's minus 180 or plus 180. And if the measurement is close to 180 and it just, there is a little bit of phase noise, like only one degree of phase noise, it can switch between the one and the other side. So it could go from plus 179.9 to minus 179.9 by just 0.2 degrees of phase noise. And that in the graph, will look like 360 degrees of phase noise, but it's not. There is a feature that is called the unwrapping. So it can unwrap the phase to display it continuously around 180 degrees, but there is an issue with that. What happens is the, if the first value is at minus 80, 180 and not at plus 180, well then your curve will just move a little bit more down. So it will always start at the first point and then display the phase continuously. And if the first point already wraps or changes by 360 degrees, then your entire curve will be once starting at plus 180 and once starting at minus 180, which is even weirder in my opinion. So what can you do about it? First of all, you could simply ignore the phase wrapping uh, because it doesn't matter. It's an artifact. It's not real. Um, or you could try to fight the phase noise to avoid phase wrapping. Or you could sweep backwards because there is normally no phase wrapping at high frequencies. And uh, if you start from the right and measure to the left, then it will be clear where the phase has to start. So you can just set the start frequency to one megahertz and stop frequency to 10 hertz. Then this measurement will run backwards and the phase wrapping or the unwrapping will work as expected. Don't forget to choose the right input attenuators when measuring with the Bode 100. The attenuators are these drop-down boxes uh, where you have receiver 1 and receiver 2. If you use external 10 to 1 probes, very often the 0 dB setting is the appropriate setting. I start with the 0 dB setting and then if there is a receiver overload, then I check is it plausible that there is one or is it just noise that causes the receiver to overload. So sometimes it makes sense to connect the scope to check if there is a lot of switching ripple going on or other noise that couples and that corrupts the measurement. So if the signals are small, you should be fine with the zero dB attenuator setting. The inputs of the Bode 100 can measure up to 100 millivolts RMS at zero dB 
and up to 10 volts RMS at 40 dB input at the setting. Then the receiver bandwidth value, that's in, the, in this box on the left hand side of the body analyzer suite. The lower this value is, the better the noise rejection will be and the higher the sensitivity of the instrument will be. But it will be slower. The higher the value is set, the faster the measurement will be, but it has less noise rejection and less sensitivity. A typical starting value for loop measurements is, uh, I would say, between 10 hertz and 300 hertz. If you want to have the measurement fast in the beginning, you can start with 300 hertz. And if you want a clean plot, then I would lower the receiver bandwidth. And 10 hertz is also something that works out pretty well. Of course, this will have an impact on the sweep time. A typical sweep time for a plot with 300 hertz is 3 seconds per sweep. And if you use 10 hertz, it will already take 55 seconds per sweep. And more than 201 points are usually not required to resolve a body plot in terms of frequency resolution. Because there are normally no high Q resonances that you need to resolve on uh, very precise frequency resolution. So with 201 points, you should be fine. You can, of course, increase it, but this will then again increase the sweep time. To measure the voltage or to connect the body 100 to the uh, channel 1 and channel 2 to the injection point, there are different possibilities. If you have low voltage signals, then you can connect it directly. And please try to use coaxial connection as close as possible to the measurement point to avoid uh, making large loops, to avoid uh, noise coupling in. So best would be to have a coaxial connector somewhere where you can connect a test cable or that you can solder a pigtail to a connection or that you use, um, for example, BNC to mini grabbers, but that already contains a little bit longer leads that are not shielded. If you use 10 to 1 passive probes, please use the PML110 probe that we provide. It will also divide the DC signal and the body 100, which has an AC coupled input. A normal scope probe with 10 mega input impedance will not divide the DC signal. So please avoid using standard oscilloscope probes 10 to 1 with the body 100. If you want to be very sure on higher voltage or are safe on higher voltages, um, you can also consider using a, an active high voltage differential probe that will, of course, provide isolation and therefore best safety for the user. Connecting the injection transformer is another topic. And also here, please be aware that the injection transformer will introduce some capacitance to ground at the injection point. And uh, if you keep leads short, it's normally nice or twisted, that's also good. What I don't like so much are these very long 1 meter 50 coaxial cables with the clip leads in the end, because this will introduce an additional extra of uh, common mode capacitance or capacitance to ground that then can also cause more noise to be introduced. If you work on higher voltages, please don't forget to use the appropriate cables, like in this case, insulated test cables. Yeah, if the measurements are still noisy, you tried everything and tried to keep the cables short, etc. Uh, maybe you will have some, you have some disturbances on the system. So take an oscilloscope and measure the output voltage and check if there is excessive ripple or if the system is limit cycling or whatever. If the system is not running in a clean operating condition, it could impact your measurement as well. Also, if you have a system with multiple loops, then please make sure that the loops run in a stable point and you need to measure them separately. So if you have a charger that has a constant current and a constant voltage operation, then uh, you need to make sure that it stays in that operation mode as long as you are measuring there. So avoid that the system transits between different modes. Also, please consider that the input filter can impact the stability of your loop. Um, the load itself can influence or will influence the loop by changing the plant and the operating point of your system of course can also have an impact on your on your uh, stability so don't forget to measure at 
lowest input, highest input, lowest load, and highest load, and all the different operating conditions. If you use electronic loads, uh, please be aware that some of them might cause strange effects in your loop, especially if they are not properly damped. So they could also impact the loop by having a ringing, ringing tendency at the output or at the input. Also, check if the system is really running on linear control. Is it, or is it maybe some pulse skipping mode or burst mode that is active, or is it hysteretic control, which is also not linear? Are you using primary side regulation, for example, or there is internal compensation and internal feedback and you can't change the compensation circuit anyhow, uh, or not even measure it? Then also think about an output impedance measurement and please check out the NISM, the non-invasive stability measurement method of uh, Steve Sandler at uh, picotest.com by checking the output impedance. You can very often tell if the system has oscillatory behavior or tendency or not. Some examples here on the input filter. Uh, here we have buck converter with an input filter and you can see the orange curve has a deviation at 10 kilohertz and that's if the input filter is not properly damped, then this can have an impact on the loop like that. With proper damping, then the impact on the loop is very low. It is still there, but it's very small. If we look at the input voltage and the output voltage using an oscilloscope, then we have the two cases here. Uh, on the upper picture, the undamped input filter shows a clear ring with several hundred millivolts on the 5 volt input. And also the output voltage will show that ring because the control loop cannot reject everything. And if we damp the filter, then that stuff is gone. If you have ferrite beads in the outputs, they also might show up in the loop gain. In this example, we have the same buck converter with a 120 ohm ferrite bead and a 10 microfarad additional decoupling cap on the load. And you can see that here at 100 kilohertz or 130 kilohertz, we see some small dip or resonance. And that is caused by a ferrite that has 120 ohms, according to the data sheet, but that's at 100 megahertz. And uh, at 1 megahertz, it has roughly 0.5 microhenries and only 30 milliohms of ESR. So if we add the 10 microfarad capacitor, that will not be 10 microfarads if it's fully charged. Um, then we see that beautiful resonance here at 135 kilohertz. The impact on the step load can also be pretty impressive. So that's a 50 milliamp load step on a 100 milliamp phase load um, with 53 degrees of phase margin. So you can see that the control loop recovers beautifully after 40 microseconds or so. And if the ferrite bead is included, then we can see that it adds this 135 kilohertz LC resonance that we have seen in the loop before. Uh, and it has pretty high Q, so it continues to ring for a very low, long time. If the control loop has only 11 degrees of phase margin, it will ring itself on every step already, and adding a ferrite bead will make this uh, step load response even more beautiful. So we have the 135 kHz LC, LC resonance from the ferrite bead and the, and the ceramic cap, the small cap, and the 23 kilohertz control loop ringing from the low damping with the low phase margin value. Don't forget that you can use nearly the same setup to measure the compensator. It's easy in analog control. So you use the same injection point. You just move the connection of channel two to the comp pin and you get the transfer function from the feedback input to the comp output, which is the compensator transfer function. And then if you connect channel one to the comp pin and channel two to the output voltage, you will get the transfer function of the plant. And if you do that, you could use the body analyzer suite to calculate the loop by multiplying the compensator transfer function with the plant transfer function using the expression traces in the body analyzer suite. And here you can see that the curves match very nice so we have the measured loop from before, we have the measured plant and the measured 
compensator and multiplying plant and compensator gives pretty much the same value as the direct measurement of the loop. Also here, that's a phase prep of the compensator transfer function. Yeah, you could also use the expression traces to calculate how much a time delay impacts your loop. So if you, for example, would switch to digital control and you know that you will have an additional one microsecond of uh, calculation delay, then you could add that by calculating, by multiplying the transfer function with a delay of one microsecond. And then you can see how the phase starts to drop off as soon as you hit higher frequencies or the phase rolls off at higher frequencies because of the delay caused by that one microsecond delay. If you have a digitally controlled system, then uh, it's easy to measure the loop, but it's more difficult to measure the plant because the company is not existing. The duty cycle or the VC uh, is present in digital, it's in the processor, but not externally. And the output is the duty cycle itself. So you could use the loop setup and set the compensator to a gain of one, and then just, um, yeah, you have basically the loop equals the plant plus the phase delay that is caused by the digital processing time. But you could use the expression trace to extract or uh, compensate for that time delay. Or you just measure the loop and you know your transfer function of the compensator pretty well because it's done in digital. So you could directly subtract that from the loop using the expression traces. Yeah, if you want to read more or about that, you have uh, put in some references here. And with that, uh, I'm done with my presentation. And I thank you for your attention.